Now it's on, right? Yes. Sorry. Okay, in any case, I wasn't saying anything new. So we managed to write down this integral. Any amplitude in this theory as an integral over the modular space of Riemann spheres with punctures. But this is not an integral. This is really a sum over contributions over different points on the modular space, and those points are determined by the solutions to the scattering equations. The scattering equations were equations that link together the kinematic invariants and the puncture positions, okay? So the conjecture is that this measure is going to take care of two of the most important properties scattering amplitudes are supposed to do, and that has to do with locality, the location of poles, and unitarity, what happens at the poles when you factorize, okay? So this is supposed to be the machine that does this work for us. So it's gonna do the heavy lifting. And then we have to come out with something that goes here that has the correct SL2C weight to make this whole thing invariant. And we started to test different things that we had on the board to find out something that did it. And we found that Fafian prime of AN had a quarter of the weight that we needed to cancel from the measure and from the scattering equations. And therefore, if we put it to the power four, everything will work out okay. Now, we said that we wanted to move on to theories that contain gauge bosons. In particular, we want to construct the theory on D-brains. So the theory on a D-brain is supposed to have a U1 gauge field, a mu, its corresponding F mu nu. Let me write it as DA. So we need polarization vectors somehow. So we said that the way to introduce polarization vectors, or at least our first try, was to construct a generalization of the matrix A so that on the second half of the matrix, we now put polarization vectors rather than, ve that, rather than momentum vectors and just let them contract in their natural way. So we would put something like this, epsilon one with k two, sigma one minus sigma two and so on. Okay, and the same thing was gonna happen here. We have K1 dot epsilon two, sigma one minus epsilon two, and so on, all the way to zero. And here we will have the contraction of the polarization vectors. Now we said that this object is anti-symmetric, as you can check clearly. So we can compute this Fafian. And since we're getting two copies, basically two copies of the same structure as the matrix A, the Fafian of this matrix carries two times the weight or the SL2C weight of the Fafian prime of A. So we can replace two powers of the Fafian prime of A for one of these ones. So we said, what if we replace two powers of this Fafian prime of A, so we keep only two, and we replace two by this object. Now, this looks pretty good because we have only one copy of the polarization vectors, and I claim that, well, it wasn't quite working, and even though it was gauge invariant, manifestly gauge invariant. So let's see why it's not working. Well, Juji was able to point out the reason why it wasn't working. So we said that it was the dimensions that were wrong, but let's actually check it. So we want to compute this theory on the D-brains, and the theory is called the Bohr-Infeld theory. If we set all the fermions and scalars to zero, we only have the gauge field, and the action is something that looks like this. If we expand, imagine there is a coupling constant here that we can set to be small. I'm not writing it there, so I'm assuming that it's absorbed in F, so I'm going to expand out. This thing has, a, we can always subtract one from here so we can remove the, the trivial piece. 
So to living order, we have Maxwell, but that theory is too boring. We wouldn't have any S matrix if that was the case. And then there will be a term F to the fourth. So the field strength will be contracted in some particular way to give us some interesting interactions, and so on. So from there, we can do the same thing that we did for the Galilean theory yesterday. We can compute the four particle amplitude. Are we going to do it? No, because we don't have time. So you could try it by yourselves. However, what we can do is to compute the dimension of this object. Let's try to count the number of powers of momentum. So there is no cubic coupling. All the coupling that we can have is the contact term that appears from that f to the fourth. But f to the fourth is something that goes like power of momenta, or let me write it as derivative of a to the fourth. So the Feynman rules will give us four powers of momenta. So this thing has to have the same dimension as four powers of momenta. Okay? Let's see why our conjecture was wrong. So the conjecture, let's write it y. Can anyone tell why, why we're calling it y? Well, I'm calling it y, but. Okay, I'll give you a chance to think. So let's try. So what happens? For four particles, there is only one scattering equation. The scattering equation has, well, first of all, the lo puncture locations are dimensionless. So we don't even have to worry about them. The scattering equation carries powers of Mandelstam invariant, but we have a delta function, so it's one over k squared from the scattering equation. Fafian prime of A, when we compute it for four particles, if you check your notes, has exactly one power of Mandelstam invariance, and we have it as square, so we have k squared square. And now the new conjecture is that this thing was going to work, but if we check, this object has maximal rank. So we just have to compute the full Fafian. Actually, I didn't need the prime here. It was just sort of habit of putting the primes everywhere. This guy doesn't have any zeros eigenvectors. That should start to look suspicious, right? By now, every single matrix that we write has at least one null eigenvector. So if we compute the Fafian of this thing, we're going to get the Fafian of a 4 by 4 matrix here and the Fafian of this thing here. Polarization vectors don't carry any dimensions. So we don't worry about them. Here, we're going to get the Fafian of a 4 by 4 matrix. So that's going to carry how many powers of momenta? It's going to carry. So if we have a 4 by 4 matrix, the Fafian will be the product of two elements, will be a polynomial in the products of two elements at the time. And each element is k squared. So we get k squared squared. So this thing cancels one of these, and what we get is k squared cubed. And we were supposed to get k, k squared squared. So we got one extra power. So let me write it like this. And this we want to get rid of. How can we do it? Any ideas? I already told you the answer, basically. I said, this matrix doesn't have any null eigenvectors. How come that it doesn't have any null eigenvectors? It has the A matrix here. So this thing is basically the A matrix. So why doesn't it have null eigenvectors? Well, let's check. Um, so you all remember that this is what we want to remove, right? One power of k squared. So what if I try and multiply this thing by this vector? So I'm going to put zeros here because I don't know what these guys do or these guys here. So this whole thing is going to give me a big zero here, right? Because when I multiply with this guy here, I only see the A matrix, so I get zero. This guy is a null eigenvector of the A matrix. But when I hit this thing, I'll be in trouble again, right? I'm going to get the sum of these things in this entry. But what should I do then? Any ideas? Have we faced this problem before? 
Yeah, cheat, exactly, yes. Very good. <laughs> oh, I mean, don't, don't sue me because I'm, I'm teaching you how to cheat. No. We're not really cheating, we're deriving things in a nice way. Right? So what we have to do is to replace this thing, say, by C11, C22, all the way to CNN, and this guy by minus C11. Why minus? Does anybody know why you have to put minus C11 minus? Whatever C11 is here, they have to put minus there. Well, because this is an anti-symmetric matrix. Okay? And what should this guy be? Well, it has to be whatever is needed in order to cancel the sum of these guys. So CAA is minus the sum of epsilon A dot KB sigma A minus sigma B from 1 to N, excluding A. And if I do it, I also get a zero here. Yes? Is it clear that what? That transforms nicely under SL2C? You have to check it. Yeah, you have to check it, yes. But it does. Now, this is an anti-symmetric matrix, and what's the size of the matrix? It's 2n by 2n. So no matter what n is, this object is always even dimensional. So it cannot possibly have a single null, null eigenvector. It must also have a second one. What do you think it is? Well, sure enough, is what you would expect. It's the second null eigenvector that the matrix A had extended with the zeros here. Now, did we spoil gauge invariance? Remember, that that's the whole thing. If we fix dimensions but we spoil gauge invariance, then Juju will complain again and say, okay, fine, so just give up. So gauge invariance, the way to check it was, say, replace this vector the polarization vector epsilon 1 by the momentum vector k1. And gauge invariance should tell you that the amplitude has to vanish, or whatever object you want to be gauge invariant has to vanish under this replacement. So if we do, you see, everywhere here, we will get a copy of this matrix here. But for this to work, this thing has to vanish. But does it vanish? Well, if you make this replacement for C11, C11 is the sum of epsilon 1 dot kb, sigma 1 minus sigma b. So if we make the replacement, this thing goes into the sum of k1 dot kb, sigma 1 minus sigma b. But isn't that one of the scattering equations, which were set into zero? So magically, the object becomes gauge invariant, trivially. Okay, so we have been able to preserve gauge invariance. It now has two null eigenvectors. And what do I do with these two null eigenvectors? So you see, given that they are only appear in the first half of the matrix, they are telling us that we can only remove two rows and two columns from the first n rows or from the first n columns. So to define, okay, now I can remove the y. So why was the y? Well, this was, our, this was our attempt yesterday. And today, we have the correct metrics. Okay, very good. So now we're going to compute the Fafian prime of this matrix, which is defined to be one over sigma i minus sigma j where i and j naturally take only values from 1 to n because we only have n mark points, the Fafian of the submetrics obtained by deleting the i and the j rows and columns. Does that object have the correct dimensions now? Well, let's check. If we were doing four particles, we're doing four particles, so we have, this is, a, this is our A matrix, we have zero, 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 zero here. And now we're instructed to remove two things from here and two things from here. And now we're left with just this piece. 
This is dimensionless because it's epsilons. This is where the S's are. And now we have removed two rows and two columns from where dimensions appear. But if you have a, a, a Fafian removing two rows and two columns, it's as if you're removing only one of the powers of the object that appears there. So we are precisely going down in dimension to the dimension that we need. So this object has the correct dimensions. It's gauge invariant. And therefore, it must be the right answer. But of course, before you get overexcited, what one has to do is to check a few examples until, until you get convinced. So even though you have your general theorem, you always try it out in Mathematica for four particles, six particles, eight, and then you are convinced that it's true. Right? So that's, <laughs> that's what you do. Now we have that our Lagrangian for Bohr infill, as complicated as it is, it has an infinite number of interaction vertices. Its full X matrix is contained in the following formula. So now we can replace this formula here by Fafian prime of A squared times Fafian prime of Psi. So this was the Galilean theory. This is Borinfeld, which is given here, not anymore. But now it's very hard to avoid the temptation of replacing these two guys by another copy of this, again. So we can also replace it and get another theory. Now this one has two copies of polarization vectors. So whatever it is, it describes a theory that contains a rank two tensor. It's massless, invariant under linearized, diffuse, and it has the correct dimension. So this thing is Einstein gravity. Coupled to a B field. And a dilatum. How nice. Right. Okay, very good. But this was our theory for D brains in general dimensions. So if you have a D brain in 56 dimensions, this is all you can do. But what if we go to three dimensions? Or two dimensions where supersymmetry is there? So that's what we want to do next. We want to move on and try to develop the theory that will allow us to describe supersymmetry. Okay, so we can call this part towards supersymmetry. And hopefully we're gonna get to supersymmetry. But let's start. So we have to start by reformulating a little bit these scattering equations. Why should I do that? Well, the scattering equations, one of the strengths that they have is that they don't care about dimensionality of the space-time. So they only depend on Mandelstam invariance. So they couldn't care less if you are in three dimensions, four, if you have n equals four supersymmetry or whatever happens, they couldn't care less. So while that is good, if you are interested in general dimensions, if you wanna go to a particular dimensionality of a space-time where we saw in the first lecture that some miracles happen, right? In four dimensions, kinematics can be described in a beautiful way using spinners in six dimensions as well. Where, are, where is all that here? Nowhere, it seems. So let's actually reformulate it in such a way that we can exploit what some people in the audience call accidents in low dimensions. I think I agree, this, these are accidents in low dimensions. Okay, 
So let's start with the equation and let's reformulate it a little bit. The first thing that I'm gonna do is to pull out the Ka mu, because after all, it doesn't appear in the sum. So what's gonna follow is a sequence of trivial manipulations. So if you see anything non-trivial, tell me. So you see what I'm doing here? I want to get rid of the fact that I have to remove A all the time here. So I want to write something that is general, something that is valid for any, for any scattering equation. So this sum is almost generic, except that I have to remove A all the time. So one possibility is to rewrite it in such a way that the eighth term is removed automatically. And one way to do that is by writing this as a contour integral, introducing a pole at z equals to sigma a, integrating around that pole, and what happens to that particular term in the sum, which is now included in the sum? What do I get when I perform that, this integration over that term in the sum? We get zero. So that looks pretty good. Okay, now let's put this guy inside the integral and see what happens, so we still get an equal sign so we get this integral over dz, and we get ka mu z minus sigma a. Some, so let me give a name to this thing so that we can save a little bit of time. Let me call it the vector omega mu. And we can write it here, omega mu of z. But you see that now, all this part seems to be the information that we're doing particle A is already here. So why should we include it in here? It seems a little redundant. So we can add things that give zero. So something that we can do is to replace this whole thing by another copy of omega. And so we have concluded that the scattering equations are equivalent. So the scattering equations imply the following. You have a rational function. This is now a rational function of z that vanishes at infinity. It has poles only at the location of the mark points, but at every one of those points, its residue vanishes. So we have this thing happens to be a rational function of z vanishes as z goes to infinity. It has simple poles at the location of the punctures, but it turns out that the residues which are computed by this integral are zero. So what could this function be? It's a rational function that vanishes at infinity at all its poles, it has zero residue, and it only has simple poles. So what's the only function you know does that exactly? So this is if and only if this function is identically zero. So the scattering equations imply that there is a map from our CP1 into the null count. So the whole CP1 is mapped into the null count. Okay, but why is this nice for us? 
Well, because we know that when we are in four dimensions or six dimensions, imposing that a vector is null allows us to do many things. So let's see which vector is null. So let me take this vector and do the following. Now you take your vector for any number of particles, you put it in Mathematica, and you press together. What's going to happen? When you do together, the thing collects everybody, and it produces something that has in the denominator all the factors, all the poles, and in the numerator it's going to produce a polynomial. And what's the degree of this polynomial? Does anybody know? What do you think? It's a polynomial for each vector index, right? So we have a collection of d polynomials. But each such polynomial has a degree. And the degree is, well, whatever it is, has to go like 1 over z at infinity, right? So we have m powers of z here. So this guy better be at least, or at most, of degree m minus 1. But what's the actual degree of this polynomial? Well, let's check. What we have to do is to compute the highest power and check if it's zero or not, and then keep going, and so on. So when we look at the highest power of this polynomial, in order to do it, what we have to do is to expand this thing around z equals to infinity and see what happens. So when we expand around z equals to infinity, what you get is the sum from a1 to n, k a mu, divided by z plus order 1. But what is this sum? The z can be pulled out, and we are summing over all moment. So it's 0 by momentum conservation. So the leading order term is 0. So this guy, sorry, order 1 over z squared, right? Yeah, that's why. Some of you were looking suspicious and just about to press the button, but I beat you. So, so this is going like 1 over z squared, not like 1 over z as we suspected. And therefore, the degree of the polynomial is 2, or at least n minus 2. You can check that the next one will be a mess, so it's very, very unlikely to be 0. So it's not 0. So this is the degree of the polynomial, is n minus 2. OK, so now we are ready. We say, let's do four dimensions. So what happens in four dimensions? We have a vector that is supposed to be null. Do we know how to write null vectors? Is there anything special about null vectors? So go back and check in your notes. So let's go and why do we want to go to four dimensions? Because we want to develop the theory of supersymmetry in this formalism. And not only get a D brain, but a D3 brain that has all the supersymmetries that it can realize. Okay. Okay. So if we go to four dimensions, we need this vector, which is a vector of polynomials. It's a null vector. But of course, I hope by now, every time you see a polynomial in four dimensions, sorry, every time you see a vector in four dimensions, and you want it to be null, you're not going to write it in terms of vector indices, but you're going to use by spinners. And you're going to write this as a matrix of polynomials. So instead of a vector with four components of polynomials, you're going to write it as a vector of polynomials. Sorry, as what? As a matrix of polynomials. Two by two. 
And if it's a null vector, what should this matrix do? What happens to the determinant? It's amazing. These whole lectures have been about matrices that, have, that don't have maximal rank. So this one doesn't have maximal rank either. So it has rank one. So its determinant has to be zero. And the determinant is given by, well, the first this component times this component. Equal to zero means that it has to agree with the components one, two dot, two, one dot. And this is because I'm writing the matrix as P one dot, P one, two dot, P two, one dot, P one, two dot, okay? So in computing the determinant of this matrix, asking that to be zero means that this must be true. But these are polynomials. So every root on this side better be a root of this side. That's one of the fundamental theorems, I guess, of something. Um, so let me see. OK. So let's split the roots. So this is a polynomial of degree m minus 2. So let's say that the roots of this polynomial happen to agree with the roots of this polynomial. I mean, it has to be true, right? Because I didn't tell you what d was. So d can be whatever it is so that the statement is true. So I'm going to call the polynomial that is shared by this guy and this guy. What do you think would be a nice name for that? Look, this guy has an index one, and this one also has an index one. So why not call it the polynomial lambda one z, which has degree d. So this guy also has that polynomial. Now this guy, the rest of the roots must be shared with this guy, because they don't have anywhere else to go, right? That's like magnetic, uh, an electric field on a sphere or something. So you have this guy. And let's call the polynomial that is shared with the other one, lambda tilde z. Now this guy, we're going to call the polynomial that is shared with this one, lambda 2 of z. Well, that is shared with this one, sorry. So this guy will have a polynomial that is shared with this one, which is called lambda 2 of z. And a guy that is shared with this one, which we're going to call lambda 2 tilde z. And we're going to put it here. Now, the degree of lambda alpha of z, now we can uh, combine these two polynomials into a spinner. So we have a spinner of polynomials. The degree is d. The degree of this one is d tilde. But the sum must be what? Now, d plus d tilde better be The degree of these two guys, if you add them up, better be the degree of a single p. But the degree of a single p, you cannot see it because it's blocked. But I'll remind you, it's m minus 2. So what we have discovered is that in four dimensions, the scattering equations must split into sectors. So we are discovering something about four dimensions that doesn't happen in any other dimension. So these sectors are determined by the degrees of these polynomials, and the degrees go from 1 to m minus 3. It doesn't go to 0, because 0 would be too degenerate to produce any kinematics that is reasonable. So the kinematics that would produce a polynomial of degree 0 would be extremely collinear. All your vectors would be collinear. So we usually neglect those kinematics points. So you have all these many sectors in four dimensions. Has anyone heard of anything like that in four dimensions? that the scattering of massless particles is split into sectors? Well, in four dimensions, you have helicity, and particles can carry plus or minus helicity. And we classify, people have been classifying scattering amplitudes by the number of negative helicity particles that appear. So the number of negative helicity particles that appear turns out to be a number that people call k, and is related to these sectors by just adding one. 
So the simplest possible sector has two negative helicity particles, which is called, people call it the MHB sector. I'm just saying this so that you, know, you have the names in your mind. If you hear a talk about scattering amplitudes, you will know what they mean. So this is the maximally helicity violating sector. And you can keep going to the next, to the maximally helicity violating sector. And this range of solutions here cover up the whole space of possible sectors. So just by doing some trivial algebraic manipulations, we have discovered something interesting about four dimensions, that there is this separation of the scattering equations into sectors. OK. So now let's write Let's pretend that we have solved the scattering equations. So we have this we have the puncture location for all the sigmas. No, it's still fine. And what we want to do is to find these polynomials. So what are the equations we have to do? So assume that you have solved all these equations. This means that you know all the sigmas. Oh, well, it should be the other way around. You know all the sigmas, or all the sigmas are known, OK? So that means that if you want to find the polynomials I was talking about, you will have to solve these equations. Why? Well, because that's what these guys do. Remember, the structure of W of omega is such that its residue at sigma a happens to be the vector ka. So in other words, this implies is that whatever this thing is, or whatever, in whatever way we wrote it, in terms of polynomials, in terms of a vector of polynomials, or in terms of a matrix of polynomials, it better satisfy that if you do the contour integral around z equals to sigma a, it better give you the vector ka. But if you do this for this thing, you pick up the pole. Now it's going to be clearer. You're going to pick up the pole at sigma a, and everything else will be evaluated at z equals to sigma a. So you're going to get this factor in the denominator, and your polynomials evaluated on the sigma a's. OK? So use these equations. to find lambda of z and lambda tilde of z, OK? So from now on, I'll assume that you have done that too, OK? So these equations are equations for the polynomials. What do I mean by the polynomials? Well, the polynomial coefficients. You're supposed to find the coefficients of these polynomials of degree d and d tilde such that these equations are satisfied. The sigmas are not variables anymore. Why? Because you read the first line, and the first line says, assume that you have solved the equations. So somebody gave you the solution. So the sigmas are not variables. The sigmas are known. And you just use these equations to find lambdas and lambda tildes. Now we can try and do a supersymmetry. Why is it going to be easy? And all this work is going to pay off. The reason is the following. Let's just take one supercharge. So let's just take n equals 1 for the moment. The supersymmetric algebra tells us that this must be true. Well, people usually write with p, so let me write with p. OK? Now, this is a generic form of the algebra. But we are not interested in fields that are off-shell and so on. We're interested in on-shell particles. 
So we're going to do the on-shell formalism. Well, what does it mean? Well, it means that we replace this by something that is on shell. And we do it for each particle. So we have for each particle, we're going to have to do the following. OK? So what's the solution of this? How can we represent this algebra? Well, one way to represent this algebra is to say that Q happens to be lambda alpha to carry the spinner index and some Grassmann number, eta, that is going to take care of the anti-commutation relation. So the same thing for Q tilde. So we're going to have lambda tilde A alpha dot and eta. And now the Grassmann variables here, they are supposed to satisfy the following property. Now, somehow, what we're seeing here is that eta and eta tilde are the Grassmann, sorry, they are the Grassmann Fourier transform versions of each other. So we could represent, if we wanted to, this guy as a derivative with respect to eta. OK. Um, let's keep going here. Now you see why we're going to be able to do supersymmetry in the 20 minutes that we have left. <laughs> the reason is that now to turn it into n equals 4 supersymmetry, it's very easy. All we have to do is to put indices that carry the supercharge. the R symmetry index. So we're going to turn these guys into four copies of themselves. So the way we're going to do it is by introducing an index that I'm going to call I or J, which are going to take values in the set 1, 2, 3, 4. So we're going to have four copies of each thing. And we're going to start putting indices like crazy, like I, J, delta I, J. We're going to put an I here. And then an I here. We're going to put a J here and a J here. It wasn't that bad. And then, last but not least, we're going to put an I and a J and delta IJ. And we're done. This is all N equals 4 supersymmetric. OK? Now we have to see how to generalize the structures we have defined so far. And the way we're going to generalize them is by looking at these equations. So for every external particle, we were able to introduce these maps that trivialize the condition that they are on shell. So this is the condition that these particles are super on shell. So we also want to introduce variables that trivialize this condition. In this case, these are the guys. But now we want to introduce them in terms of maps. And the way we do it is by asking this thing to supersymmetrize this formula. By introducing a supermap. So this is going to be tilde i product a sigma a minus sigma b from b1 to n, and b different from a. OK? And we can do the same thing, same for q tilde a alpha dot j. Good. So why is that useful? Well, it's useful for the following reason. I told you to review the little group, right? I hope you all did it. So you all review what the little group is in four and six dimensions. I'm not, you are, you're in luck because we don't have time to ask you questions about it. So I was planning to give you a pop quiz or something, but we don't have time for that. So 
the little group or the way you can tell the helicity of the particles will act on the lambdas and the lambda tildes by a rescaling. And therefore, the Grassmann variables will also transform in order to eat up that transformation. So if we write something that happens to be a polynomial in Grassmann variables, it's going to be something that contains all the information of all the particles that you want in your supersymmetric theory all at once. So let's see if we can succeed. So we're going to write the supersymmetric generalization. So this should be the super boring fell action. Well, not the action, but the S matrix. So we're going to start with the bosonic one that we had. So we have our magic measure. We had the Fafian prime of A square. And then we had the Fafian prime of Psi that contains all the polarization information. Now, polarization are just for the particles of helicity plus minus one. These are the gauge bosons. But we want to write something that is completely supersymmetric. And you know from Shota's lectures that N equals four supersymmetric theories, the N equals four supermultiplet not only contains the gauge bosons, it also contains what? Contains fermions and it contains scalars. How many fermions? So it should contain four and it should contain six scalars, right? So in terms of helicity, the decomposition is the following. You have one particle with helicity minus one. You have four particles with helicity minus a half, six with helicity zero, four with helicity a half, and you have one with helicity plus one. So all we want to do is to write a formula that contains all the possible scattering amplitudes for any kind of particles that you want in this theory. Well, let's try the simplest thing that you can imagine, which is to replace this Fafian by the product. So we first have to introduce what these guys are. So let me introduce this eta i or z. The coefficients of this polynomial are Grassmann variables. So the coefficients, I'm going to call them chi 0, i, chi 1, z, all the way to d, because I said that these guys are of degree d. So these are Grassmann coefficients that we don't see in our answer. So we have to integrate over them. So I'm going to integrate over all possible chi's from 0 to d. So this is really a d4 because we have four indices because we have n equals four SUSY. And then we're going to impose the constraints we have over there, these constraints. We're going to ask this thing. So let me write it as Q, QA, I, alpha, minus lambda alpha, sigma A, eta, I, sigma A, product of sigma A, minus sigma B, B different from A. Now you take this thing and you check the SL to C weight. And it turns out to have the same SL to C weight as the object you remove. Then it's looking good, right? So this thing has the same SL to C weight as the Fafian prime of Psi. So it seems that we don't need anything else to at least have a conjecture. Well, it turns out as you can tell by the time, that the conjecture must be right. Because otherwise, I wouldn't be telling you at this time this formula. So this is the object that describes the scattering, the S matrix of a D3 brain. Now, D3 brain meaning the full D3 brain in type 2B theory, the one that has all n equals 4 SUSIs realized. But you would complain if we don't make it to the M5 brain, right? We said that we wanted to do the M5 brain, so we should do it. 
at the risk of upsetting Juji, we're going to try. But maybe it's not going to be that difficult. So what, what's special in six dimensions? So go back to your notes. Check what happens in six dimensions. So in six dimensions, a null vector, what we do with a null vector is to contract it with the Pauli matrices to construct an anti-symmetric four by four matrix. And asking this object to be null implies that this guy can be written as the following. Let me introduce a shorthand notation which will remind you of the shorthand notation because we actually did it. So the contraction of the little group indices. Now this alpha and beta are little group indices. In our previous story in four dimensions, alpha and beta were what? What kind of indices? Anyone? So we had lambda alpha and lambda alpha dot. So alpha and alpha dot are what kind of indices? They are Lorentz indices in the spinor representation, in the, chi in the positive chirality or negative chirality, but they are Lorentz indices. Who are the Lorentz indices here? So let's actually write it. These guys transform under the Lorentz group, okay? And these guys are the little group indices. Okay, so now we're ready. So why are we ready? Because again, we have that the scattering equations imply that this map exists. So we can again contract it with this to produce a polynomial of degree n minus two. That hasn't changed. Now this polynomial of degree n minus two, we can also write in this form, and this guarantees that it's a null vector. But how do we know that this thing is a null vector? Okay, the indices don't quite work, but let me do it like this, then put the mu here, a, b, a mu here, say. So how do we know that this is a null vector? Because the scattering equations, we're assuming that you have solved them, so the scattering equations are telling you that this is a null vector, and therefore we can write it like that. But that sounds a little bit strange if n is odd, right? Because n minus two will be odd. So how do we distribute the degrees here? That would be kind of awkward. Luckily for us, the M5 frame theory is supposed to have only even number of particles. Also the theory that we had before on the D3 brain vanishes for any, num any odd number of particles. So n is even. And therefore, n minus 2 is even. And that means that the degree of lambda a can be taken to be n half minus 1. All right. So what are the equations we have to impose? equations for these maps. These are also polynomials, and we're supposed to find their coefficients. So what are the equations? Well, we are supposed to evaluate this on sigma a. So get ka for every particle, which is given, as we know, by this formula. 
and require these to agree with the maps when they are evaluated on sigma A. And these equations, solving these equations for all particles will determine what these maps are. So now we have the sigmas and we know the maps, lambdas. We know these polynomials. What's next? Well, we have to supersymmetrize this object. Now, what we do to supersymmetrize is that we introduce a Q again that will have is a spinner index. So this is the Lorentz index. It will have the particle index. And we require this to be the supersymmetric generalization of these equations. Where once again, these are collections of spinners. But this is if we have only one supersymmetry. But the M5 brain theory has two supersymmetries, two chiral supersymmetries. So in order to in increase the number of supersymmetries, now we know the trick. All we have to do is to put another index. Now this i goes from 1 to 2. We put the index here, here, and here. And if we follow the trick that we used before, so let me show you. You probably have it in your notes. But let's bring it here. We're going to try the same thing. So let's try the m particle amplitude for the m5 brain. We're going to try exactly the same thing. And what are we going to put here? Well, we're going to put the same integral over the maps, this time over how many maps we have. And we also have them from 0 to the degree d. The degree d here, as we said, is n half minus 1. We have 2 for each. And then the product of all these constraints that we just copy from there. So I'm not going to write explicitly everything because it's just taken from this formula, which I'm going to impose here as a constraint. So what's the next thing that we have to do? We have to check what? The SL2C weight. So we check the SL2C weight. And what do you think? No, it doesn't work with only two minutes to go. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work. It actually carries only the same amount as a single Fafian prime of A. So the same And what do we need? We need two. So what would you try? A square it? No, I will have 4, 0 supersymmetry. No, come on. <coughs> How about that? <laughs> okay, so that's the conjecture. That's the conjecture in, once again, Schwartz and Wang. this paper. Now, they have done many, many checks on this thing. 
one of the checks is that this thing upon dimensional reduction to four dimensions has to become what? That thing. It has to become the action of the D3 brain. Another check that they have done is they have computed, as I said, of course, the four, the six, and the eight particle amplitudes for many different objects. So just so that uh, you go with an impression of the field content of this, of this theory. Each particle can be expanded in terms of this spinner's eta as follows. So let me write it for you. Yeah, so that at least you see it once. Well, maybe you, you would only want to see it once if I keep writing. Yes, there is another term. And this other term, well, basically contains is ij, epsilon, kn, eta, alpha, i, eta, j, beta, eta, eta, phi prime. It's just because it's another, another scalar field. So you see the field content of this theory. It contains, it contains one, two, plus three, five scalars, it contains the fermions, and it contains the B field that I promised, which has a self-dual field strength, okay? Now you can, if you want, you can start computing this object and extracting the components, because this is a generating function with the Grassmann variables, so the way you extract amplitudes that you are interested in is by projecting out or extracting from this object, which is a polynomial in the etas for each particle, the piece that you are interested in, okay? So that's the beauty of supersymmetry. It allows you to recombine all this information into a single generating function and then study its symmetries or its properties without having to deal with an incredible number of objects, okay? So I think this is a good time to, a good place to stop. Thank you. Oh yeah, I forgot to say. Now you are supposed to make this non-abelian and write a spectacular paper. <laughs> no, well, the, the, the non-abelian theory, we're not supposed to be able to write down an S matrix for it. Well, because it doesn't have a natural expansion parameter. In this case, in this case you have the Planck length as an expansion parameter, but for the non-abelian theory, is in the wrong place. Sorry? Can, can you put down your... But it does have asymptotic states. Right? Well, tell me what they are. No one knows, yes. So in fact, you can show that the three particle amplitude, it has been proven that the three particle amplitude cannot be made supersymmetric, 2,0 supersymmetric. So there isn't any three particle, two comma zero supersymmetric. So even the starting point gets you, gets you stuck. Or the other way around, you get stuck at the starting point. Yes, that's right. No, but, but, but maybe we shouldn't tell people, we shouldn't tell people, no, yeah, so we did the wrong thing. We have to tell, we have to tell them, no, of course you can try now, just go and try. And who knows, maybe you will find a way to do it. <laughs> I mean, I mean it's, a, it's, it's not a good thing to, to tell people what it's impossible to do, right? Because it's often proven to be wrong. Yeah. Okay. So maybe maybe we should help Yuji with. A... Is it known what theory you obtain when, for example, in this formula or for the Dirac-Born-Infeld, replace Pfaffian 
a n squared with, with Fafi and Psi? You mean in the, in the other case, or to replace case. it by, a, by oh. something that has Fafi and Psi? Yeah. Um, so what could that possibly be? Uh, yeah, so in the other case, you get, uh, you're going to get some, so you should get some kind of supergravity. Yeah, I think people, people have started to look at that. So you can start combining objects and get different sorts of supergravities or Yang Mills theories even. Uh, if you, not for the 2,0 one, but the, actually, it's very, it's very interesting. If you just replace these two here by one and put another copy of this object here and you put tildes using the anti carrier representation, you get the D5 brain theory. And that one is 1,1 1, 1 supersymmetry. And that one can be made non-abelian very easily. So there is something that, OK, so I agree with Amit. Maybe you should try, yes. Yeah, this is a good starting point for that. <laughs> OK. I just have one a bit technical question. It seems that in this construction, you broke the symmetry between the Q and the Q tildes, because if I do the same with Q tildes and then take the anti-commutator, the denominator will be squared. Where? For these things? Yes. No, remember, these guys, these guys are designed to give you. Yeah, but suppose I write this in an identical equation with tildes and then take the anti commutator. Well, but these guys, the, I didn't tell you how these guys match the, the standard ethos. <coughs> right? Mm -hmm. I, didn't tell you, I didn't tell you how, how these things are constrained to satisfy an anti commutation relation. We're not, we're not determining the ethos, right? We've been talking about n equal to 4 that, that we did. Yeah, even in the previous case, we're not determining the ethos. We're integrating over them. So, they are, so, so they will, the ethos and the eta tildes will have to satisfy some crazy anti-commutation relation. Oh, I thought it was one. OK. Yes. Any other okay. questions still? You want? Do you want to? So I have a question about the first lecture. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you explained that this uh, blow-up procedure of the mock points was related to the uh, residues of the poles. Yes. Could you elaborate on that, how this connection comes about? Um, well, the connection is, is just at the level of take, take the Riemann surface, right? and embed it in CP2, right? So embed the Riemann surface in CP2, you get an equation that looks like x times y equals to 0 at the, at the location where, where you get the singularity. Do the blow up there, and you see explicitly, beautifully, the two Riemann spheres, and they are the ones that are supposed to reproduce the lower point amplitudes. That's the connection. So not only they tell you where the singularity is, but they also tell you what the residue is. Of course, you'll have to embed it in CP2 and do this in locally to see explicitly how the blow up works. But you do it and the formula, and repeat that in the formula, and the formula factorizes. OK, any other questions? Then let's uh, thank Freddie again.